All right, so we spent uh, um, a lot of time now talking about the Italian Renaissance and the, the things that are happening in the southern part of, uh, of Europe. And uh, now I want to kind of shift our attention uh, north, and we're going to talk about, um, look at some questions and, and some aspects of the Renaissance that filtered their way up into uh, places like what, what we would call Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands and, and England, and see if we see similar kind of things playing out in that part of Europe that we see in, um, in, in Italy. And, and as we'll see, we'll see, um, yes, definitely some overlap in terms of leaps forward in artistic and architectural um, invention, um, uh, ways of interpreting literature, religious changes, and all that stuff. We'll see lots of a similar kinds of changes happening in the North, but with its own particular kind of flavor and, and flair. And then um, that will kind of give us a broad foundation to jump off when, in the later part of this week, we'll start talking about uh, Shakespeare. And one of the things we'll, we'll consider is, is, is Shakespeare uh, kind of a typical um, uh, kind of Northern Renaissance persona? Is, uh, are his plays and his sonnets, his poetry, kind of representative of also these larger changes that are happening um, in, um, in, in Northern Europe? Or him being a Brit, um, and, and the, you know, the Britain being an island, uh, is it something different? Is it more kind of isolated than what's going on on the uh, kind of the European continent? So I have a few questions here that we can consider as we, as we move along. Um, what changes were happening uh, north of the Alps? Um, how do the Northern and Italian Renaissances compare? Uh, what kind of styles and themes mark the art of the Northern Renaissance? We'll see it's in many ways, it's in terms of style. Um, it's radically different than what we saw from the paintbrushes of Raphael, Michelangelo, and Botticelli. How do different attitudes toward uh, and arrangements of politics and religion affect the Northern Renaissance? Uh, very different. We'll talk uh, at the end of this, um, the kind of the, the major split in Christian orthodoxy, the, the Protestant Reformation. And does the art of both Italian and Northern Renaissance communicate in similar ways uh, about the human body, use of symbolism, and just the sim simply the kinds of subject matter uh, chosen. So um, let's start this off. So some, some hallmarks of the Northern Renaissance. Um, I, can't, I can't overstate the, uh, the importance and centrality of this. Uh, the invention of the printing press happens in the middle part of the 15th century, usually credited to one uh, Johannes Gu Gutenberg. And um, it's the first time that uh, in Western civilization that we see a way to kind of mass produce a text. And then up until this point, more or less, if you wanted a, a book, it had to be a hand copied um, copy of a previous um, uh, version of that book. And in 1450, around 1450, this changes everything, a monumental change in human technology. And um, it leads to uh, an explosion of, in some ways, literacy and the availability of texts. Um, it's like, like I said, it's hard to overstate the importance of that. Um, advent of mechanically reproducible media, such as woodcuts and engravings. Um, whereas, again, in the Italian Renaissance, you tend to have, um, in terms of like Michelangelo's and Raphael's paintings, you know, large frescoes um, painted onto, onto walls or onto plaster. Um, and, but kind of like they were doing with the printing press in the north, they were also uh, um, finding ways to reproduce artworks. And so you have a woodcut um, and engravings from which you can make uh, kind of prints. So again, the reproducibility um, leads to kind of the, the wide availability of, uh, of artworks as well, as well as, um, you know, written media. Formation of a merchant class of art patrons that purchase works uh, in oil on panel. So in this way, it kind of uh, mimics what's happening in Florence, the, the Medici, um, a, a, you know, a more secularized um, business class, upper class, that's now spending their money on, on art, um, attracting artists from all over to paint works to decorate their homes and to decorate public squares, very similar to what we saw earlier. Um, the Protestant Reformation, the translation of the Bible from the original languages into the vernacular or common languages such as German and French. Again, hard to overstate um, what a game changer this is. So up until the Protestant Reformation, up until the 15th and 16th century, um, the Bible uh, again, was in its original languages, Hebrew in the Old Testament, uh, Greek in the New Testament. It had been translated into Latin um, by Jerome in the 5th century. Um, and that's more or less where it stayed. And so if for the, you know, the worshiping faithful, if you wanted to um, you know, know what was in the Bible, you either had to know these languages, which was very rare. I mean, that was uh, amongst the, 
uh, something for the you know the elite educated classes, um, you know, or it had to be interpreted for you kind of through the um, the medium of a priest, and um, the Bible being translated into local languages, uh, German and French, and we see a little later Italian as well. Um, again, puts the uh, the scriptures into the hands of the um, of the literate masses, such as it were. And uh, this is a, a, a huge part of what upends um, uh, kind of Catholic control of, uh, of religion and, and ritual and worship and the like. Um, international trade in urban centers, uh, again, a similar kind of thing that we saw in Venice and in Florence and, and, and Rome, um, up in the north in, in places like Antwerp and, and London, uh, places in France and Germany. They also become hubs of cross-cultural uh, exchange and trade, and this brings in wealth, this brings in new ideas, um, again, very similar to what we see happening throughout Europe. Right, and this, so in this, um, this map, in these kind of two insets, we see the heart down here, uh, this is the blow up of this, uh, kind of the heart of the so-called Italian Renaissance, again, Florence really at the center of it, but you know, Pisa, Siena, Rome, of course, uh, Bologna, Venice to the north, Milan, and then this inset blown up here, uh, the so-called heart of the Northern Renaissance, and it centers really on what we would call Belgium and the Netherlands, um, you know, Antwerp, uh, Amsterdam, Brussels, uh, Paris down here, Cologne in what we call Germany, and then London here across the, the channel. So in this lecture, we'd be mostly kind of um, concerned of what kind of moves and movements and um, changes and inventions are happening in this particular area, which becomes again, as influential in its own way as what happened in Italy uh, roughly around the same time or just before the period we're talking about. All right, so if we were to compare kind of Northern Renaissance versus the, the Southern Italian Renaissance, um, the kind of just the basis of culture is, is radically different. So, you know, in Italy, you have, you know, the ruins of the Roman Empire all around them. You know, you have the Colosseum and the, the temples and the, the, you know, the Roman Forum. And so there was kind of that visible kind of ancient Greco-Roman culture that was all around them. And as we've talked about, you know, the Italian Renaissance was in many ways um, based around um, reviving kind of ancient Greek and Roman ideas and then taking them in a new direction. Well, in the north, um, there was less of that. Now, the, you know, the Romans pushed their empire up into what we would call France and Germany and, and, uh, and England, but it was really just the borderlands of the Roman Empire. And did not, the, the Romans didn't leave their kind of architectural and cultural stamp as deeply in the north as they did um, in and around Rome, which kind of makes sense, right? And so the north doesn't have kind of that deep classical culture to draw from. And so in terms of artistry, um, you know, unlike with Michelangelo and Raphael drawing on these, you know, classical myth myths and, and the like, and again, it would be interpreting through a kind of a Catholic or Christian lens, we see uh, artists in the north really drawing on everyday lives and their surroundings. So we get more um, paintings of nature. We get more kind of domestic uh, 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 portraits, uh, do, uh, you know, things of you know everyday everyday life and the like, and so it's a it's a very different palette to draw from. So we don't see certainly not as much um, attention to Greek mythology, um, no grandiose homages to antiquity, and you know this idea that you know the, that deep well of Greco-Roman wisdom and philosophy and art and architecture it just wasn't there geographically in the north, and so it doesn't leave its imprint. Um, but what instead you get is, and, and when we start to, kind of, we'll compare a couple of these kind of northern paintings to Italian paintings, um, the attention to detail, and uh, in some ways almost a, almost kind of approaching a kind of photographic realism that you see in the north is extraordinary. And in terms of kind of representing real, uh, nature and life in these uh, strikingly realistic kind of ways, it goes well beyond what, you know, even artists like Michelangelo were, were doing um, uh, in painting. You know, I think, I think you see you know, in um, in the Italian Renaissance, you see, there, I mean, there's lots of realism. Like we saw Michelangelo's David and, you know, the frescoes on the Sistine Chapel. Um, there's a realism about them, but it's also extremely idealized as well. And I think maybe in the North, we start to see more kind of, you know, warts and all. Um, less of kind of an ideal, um, you know, classical, you know, godlike hero um, physiques and the like. And a little bit more down to earth. Um, see if you agree with that. So... We'll compare a couple of, uh, of paintings that I'll have up on the screen in a moment. So um, Jan van Eyck, who was a kind of a Northern Renaissance, I think he was a, a Belgian painter, um, and Masaccio, who's kind of an early Renaissance painter, 
um, both dealing with kind of biblical themes. I mean, that's one of the things they share in common, but w- look how different they are. So this is the Annunciation. So this is um, refers to um, kind of a biblical passage in when the, the angel appears to uh, Mary. And this is just a, a blow up of this. You can get some of the detail. And you see kind of the, the dove of the Holy Spirit dispend, uh, descending upon her head. And she um, she says, you know, hail um, Mother Mary, full of grace. Um, and she says, you know, um, it's, it's going to be backwards here. And, um, behold, um, behold something. Okay. Um, and so the, the angel is announcing to Mary that she will be the one to uh, give birth to the Christ child. And, I mean, look at just the extraordinary detail. Um, like, and everything is filled, you know, from the carpet down here to this footstool, this book on a, on a book stand, the upper reaches of the architecture here, which you can see in more detail. Um, there's nothing really in the Italian Renaissance that goes to this uh, kind of detail. And what's really striking, too, is that, in, like, at least in Van Eyck's paintings, uh, the canvases are, uh, compared to what you see you know, Michelangelo doing, they're very small. And so you have this exquisite detail in this small space, you know, even kind of this, these blocked glass, leaded glass windows back here. Um, it's extraordinary. Uh, so that, that's what I mean by the attention to detail in line and shading, approaching almost a kind of uh, photographic realism. I mean, look at the folds, the incredible uh, detail, the folds on, on Mary's dress here. And then compared to Masaccio, it, it, maybe not a fair comparison. Masaccio is a fairly um, you know, early Renaissance painter, I think he comes in a little bit before, um, you know, Raphael and Botticelli and, and Michelangelo. But um, this is, again, a fairly typical early Renaissance painting. Uh, with these bright pastel colors, um, some interest in, interest in perspective, um, kind of nature in the background, uh, kind of this, this building here giving you a kind of vanishing point in depth to it. But, you know, the figures are still rather stiff. Um, they're not approaching that kind of realism that we just saw with Van Eyck. Um, this, is a, a, this is a painting called The Tribute Money which is, um, shows kind of a part of a cycle in the life of, of, of Peter, who's over here, and this is Jesus. Again, the halos here kind of mark the, the disciples and the, the holy figures here. Um, one of a number of panels showing different things happening in the life of, of, of Peter. But in terms of realism, you know, it's a, it's a sea change uh, between what we see here and in Van Eyck's painting. Or if you look at, like, uh, even more so, like an engraving like this from Albrecht Durer, um, a, northern, a northern artist, um, again, a simple... Kind of picture and just taken from from um, from nature. You know, there's nothing biblical. There's nothing mythological here, um, but the attention to detail and depth and realism. Uh, you can see the date here engraved this in 1502. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, here's another uh, kind of northern artist, another um, kind of Belgian painter, Peter Bruegel, the Elder, um, which I don't think he accomplishes the kind of realism that we see in Van Eyck or in Durer, um, but again, it's a it's, it's a really kind of interesting, I won't go into all the details here because there's you know, too much to say, is that this is a painting that presents itself as, um, you know, a, just a kind of domestic, everyday landscape. You have a, a plowman plowing the field. You have kind of a daydreaming uh, shepherd here. You have a fisherman down here uh, looking down at his line. You have sheep. You have, you have birds. Um, but, you know, the, you have that kind of exquisite detail with the ship and its, um, its riggings and the sails and, and the like. Um, in, in, as such, you know, a very typical northern painting. Now, this is one that actually engages with classical mythology, um, albeit in a very interesting and almost hidden picture kind of way. And so this painting, uh, I don't think, as I understand it, Bruegel didn't give this painting this title, or there's no evidence that he did, but it's known as Landscape, which is most of this, um, with the fall of Icarus. I'm sure some of you know the, the famous uh, Greek mythological story of Daedalus and Icarus, where Daedalus is the great inventor, and he, he wants to escape his slavery on the island of Crete. So he builds wings for himself and his son, but he tells his son, um, you know, don't fly too high because the, the, the heat of the sun will melt the wax from your wings and you'll plunge to your death. Um, but Icarus doesn't listen to his father, and that's exactly what happens. And here's Icarus down here. All you see are his legs kicking and some of the feathers from his um, his broken wings um, fluttering about here. And uh, again, we don't have time to go into all what, what this all means. Um, I mean, I think at, at heart, it's about um, Bruegel's kind of answering uh, a, a kind of a typical kind of mythical, mythological portrayal. He says, you know, a usual painting of Daedalus and Icarus would maybe show him in kind of great tragic fashion, you know, plunging from the sky, and his father would be flying and tragically looking back at him, helpless to do anything about it. And Bruegel seems to be saying something. He says, well, you know, 
that's all that's all well and good, but that's not really real life, right? Real life is this. Real life is drudgery. Real life is your job. And, um, you know, the mythic moments, these grand tra- tragic mythic moments, um, if they're there, we tend to tend to miss them. There's a lot more to it. I mean, you should take my mythology course where we talk a lot more about those. Um, here's another Van Dyke painting. Um, this is another famous one that is, uh, again, very enigmatic. Uh, it's called the Arnolfini Portrait. And it's enigmatic because we don't know a lot about the, the people um, painted here. But, it's a, again, it it's a, seems to be a, uh, a, a, a maybe perhaps a wedding portrait. Um, a lot of these kinds of things would be would were being done. So if you if you were wealthy enough, you might um, you might hire a, a, a painter to paint you and your new bride. Um, but this one comes with a lot more kind of symbolic baggage. And we know that um, it, it was painted of the husband and wife, the Arnolfinis. But there's a lot going on in this painting, and um, it's a small painting. But the attention to detail and the perspectives is so extraordinary that I want to I want to look into. Um, kind of what's going on here. So it's an oil on canvas, um, but it's filled with lots of mystery. And um, so some have, have seen, well, it's, it presents itself as kind of a wedding portrait. This, um, this uh, uh, gentleman has taken his, his, wife, his wife's hand here, um, maybe in, in, uh, you know, in matrimony. He's got a, his hand up in a kind of religious blessing, maybe signifying kind of the sacred rite of marriage. But there's a lot more going on. Who are these people? What exactly is being shown here, and what is the symbolism at play? So there's lots of you know, different objects. There's this really extraordinary um, mirror in the background, which shows the um, uh, uh, kind of the back of these people. I'll show you a detail of, of this. Um, and it's amazing how um, exquisitely minute the details of Van Eyck presents this. Um, but let me show you some things. So um, what's going on here? So some have thought that it's not really a wedding portrait, but it's a... Um, it's a painting that this man here had painted to to um, commemorate the short life of his of his wife, who has died young, um, perhaps dying in childbirth, um, as the as the story sometimes goes. Some have thought in kind of the way that her gown kind of bulges out here that she's shown to be pregnant. Others said no, it's just the style of the day. But some have said that you know that the red uh, background of the furniture and the bedspread here represents death you know, bleeding and, and, and such, and, and um, that the fact, we, yes, she is pregnant, and the symbolism is that they were, you know, um, fairly newly married, but she died in childbirth in this, uh, you know, a way of showing kind of his, his love, uh, affection, and wanting to remember his wife. So there's a number of things that, you know, um, here are the clogs down here, um, that the, the his shoes are taken off. I, again, I, sh- I show them just because look at the extraordinary detail. You can even see some of the worn wood at the bottom of these shoes. But the fact that Mr. Arnolfini has taken off his shoes is often a symbol that something sacred is going on here. So either a wedding or a funeral or both. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the details of the hand, uh, the fact that they aren't really holding hands and that he's clutching, he's taking her by his left hand. Um, by and large, kind of around the world, um, left hand side is is is, is uh, speaks of ill fortune. Right hand side is lucky, a good fortune. So the fact that he's taking her open hand with his left hand again, might symbolically show that something uh, bad has happened. Um, we have the dog down here. Dogs in this era, in this area, were often symbols of fidelity. The loyal dog, you know, the, the classic dog name of Fido just means, you know, loyal, faithful. And so it represents kind of the, a fidelity between husband and wife. Um, up above uh, the wife's head, or both of their heads, actually, you see this wonderful, uh, detailed, realistic chandelier. And you can see above... His head is a lit candle, and above her head, or nearly above her head, is this uh, candle that has melted down and has been snuffed out. So some see that as, again, he's still alive, but she has passed on. Um, oranges kind of scattered about is taken to be a symbol of um, wealth. Uh, the fact that, you know, we're up in the north here where oranges don't grow. And so if you had oranges in your house, you had to import them. They had to travel a long distance. And to, so to have them shipped to your place and to have them fresh and the like, and also to kind of have the, um, you know, the casual attitude just to kind of leave these very valuable and expensive fruits just scattered about, I guess it may be, may be a way from Arnolfini to kind of show, again, beyond his dress and his, and his possessions that he's, that he's wealthy. Um, yeah, also in the background here, you see this cherry tree growing out um, where the window is also perhaps a symbol of, of kind of personal wealth and, and prosperity. Um, yeah, note again, just in terms of this, not in terms of symbolism, but just the exquisite detail 
of you know this um, decoration on her de- on her dress and her robes and the folds and, and the, the shadows and then the rug on the on the floor in the in the background. Van Eyck, uh, extraordinary in his detail. He said to have painted a lot of this with kind of a single horsehair brush. Um, uh, the, the amount of skill and patience needed for that just boggles my mind. Um, then, yeah, kind of above uh, on the doorpost in the bed, you see uh, maybe this demonic figure with a kind of, again, angelic, um, real holy figure here. Again, maybe symbols of, uh, kind of, of her death, um, the rite of a funeral, something dark, um, sad has happened, possibly. And then kind of my favorite detail is this, is this mirror that's in the back. And um, I'll show you the, the, uh, the kind of the, the size of this painting as it appears in the gallery. It's not a large painting. So to do this kind of tiny, tiny detail is amazing. And so in this curved circular mirror, you can see, you see the curve of the window. Um, you see the back of the husband and the wife. But you also see people here. You see the, the, um, the artist painting, Van Eyck himself, and some sort of female visitor at his side. Um, again, who is the, who are these people? It's kind of, again, kind of, Hidden pictures. Um, it invites, it, it rewards the close viewer and the like. And then these little, um, these little ornate uh, circular panels around the mirror show the, the different stages in the life of the Passion of, of Christ, from you know, uh, the, the the Last Supper and the betrayal and the crucifixion, uh, and the like. And you have these prayer beads over here, or a rosary perhaps, um, signifying religious devotion. And then right above the mirror, he signed it. In, in a tiny, tiny detail that if you were to see this in person, you'd have to squint to see. Here's a blown up detail. And it says, Johannes de Eyck, uh, Jan van Eyck. And then in Latin, it says, Fuit hic, Jan van Eyck was here. Like a graffiti, you know, um, you know like Bob was here. He signs it um, that he was here in this tiny detail. And then this is a kind of a stylized date, 1430-34. So this is what it looks like today um, on, a, on a panel. I wish I had somebody standing here for... Um, for scale, but you can tell that is not a large painting. It, its size is, um, you know, two two feet eight inches tall uh, and two feet wide. This is not a massive Italian Renaissance fresco, and that to me makes kind of the extraordinary t- minute detail all the more impressive. Um, and it's one of these things. It's one of these portraits. Maybe it's I, I. I mean, I'd be curious to know if if you guys had seen it before, or recognized it. I don't think it has, um, you know, the currency of like a, of a David or a Sistine Chapel. Um, but whenever you see something parodied, that suggests that it's fairly well known. So here's a Muppet version of the Arnolfini portrait. Uh, here's a, like a horribly cheesy one with uh, Anakin Skywalker and um, Padme. And uh, instead of the dog, you have R2-D2. Um, but again, the joke, the satire relies on that you know the original, as it were. And this is just this just struck me here. Again, this, this very kind of, you know, curious, characterful, character-filled face of Mr. Arnolfini here. Um, always reminds me very much of Vladimir Putin, although Vladimir Putin is a, a, you know, a Russian, a Slavic person, and this is a, a Belgian, but they seem to strikingly share a physical characteristics. Here's another one by Velasquez, um, a, a Spanish painter, again, doing similar kinds of things Van Eyck. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's, it strikes me, again, Northern, pa- uh, sorry, Italian painters weren't doing this kind of thing. And um, here we have kind of a mirror here which shows, um, it kind of puts you into the painting. So here's Velasquez painting this portrait. Well, who's the painting the portrait of? He's kind of looking at, right at us. So as you look at this painting, you become part of the story. It's like he's painting your portrait. But in this mirror, we see uh, a man and a woman, and that's the people that are standing kind of where we're standing, and that's who he's painting in this portrait. And we think this is the, the king and queen of Spain. So he's painting a royal portrait. Um, and then there's all these other details as well of this, um, what seems to be a princess um, there on display with her fancy dress and another dog and other people. The, you know, who's this guy who's either coming in or coming out of, the, out of the room? There's a lot going on here. But that kind of dramatic notion of kind of adding mirrors and weird perspectives of um, incorporating the viewer who is now kind of part of the painting is, I find that so fascinating, so interesting. And so compelling. Um, and uh, this is stuff you see in the North, not in the South. So what's going on else kind of beyond art, kind of art into architecture? What's happening politically? Um, very different than in Italy, uh, where in Italy we're seeing in places like Florence, a kind of a flirtation with 
kind of a kind of free, a kind of wildly free market capitalism, and a kind of uh, democracy, a kind of republic. Uh, Italy seems to be moving away from kings, as it were, even though the you know the the authority of the pope is still very very present. Um, in the north, in England, France, and Spain, these are nations that are kind of coalescing around powerful royals, uh, kings and queens, and moving away from any kind of stirrings of, of, uh, kind of a republicanism, um, small r, and, and uh, democratization. And so, um, and, but they also are kind of, they're, they're recognizing the, kind of the very interesting stuff that's happening in the, in the South. And so, um, if you remember, in, when we were talking about Leonardo, um, at the end of his life, King Francis, the first of France, lures him away. And are you know kind of uh, you know, drawing away, luring with with money and and kind of the um, you know these these kind of these posts where you they just want you there to add prestige uh, to their um, to their regime, and um, they become kind of the in-house uh, artists. And so you're getting you're getting kind of a, a cultural diffusion. You're getting kind of a mix of of, of styles, a mix of ideas. Um, so I don't want to kind of give you the impression that you have kind of this north and there's kind of a, you know, a, a border between them, although there, there are the Alps um, and then the south and they're, you know, never the twain shall meet. It was, it was much more fluid than that, but distinct at the same time. Um, the north, like the south, uh, you know, in uh, kind of building up to the, the Protestant Reformation had deep ties to the Catholic Church, uh, although the farther away you get from the Pope, the different things become. Um, and so, uh, not as reliant on uh, kind of these classical models, you know. Whereas, you know, the Italian Renaissance we see in art and even in literature and even religious expression, it's kind of a mix between these pre-Christian pagan Greeks and Romans and you know thinkers and authors and poets, and mixing that with biblical um, um, literature at the same time. In the North, yeah, there's some of that kind of that knowledge of antiquity that that it filters up. Um, uh, but again, mixing with the moral teachings of Jesus Christ, but but not as rooted in uh, these ancient classical authors. And so, uh, in the South, again, there's almost a movement away from kind of considering the Bible kind of as literature, and the literary focus is on kind of pre-Christian authors and thinkers and speakers and orators like Virgil, the Roman poet Virgil, and Cicero, the great Roman orator and, and writer and, and, and politician. Um, in the North. Again, there's much more on the much more of a focus on on the text of the Bible itself, um, and I think out of this comes this idea that well, you know, why should the the Bible remain in Hebrew and Greek and Latin um, languages that you know fewer and fewer people every year are a able to read? Um, let's get it to the people, and so it starts to be translated into French, into German, um, and then also uh, translations of church fathers such as uh, Augustine and Jerome. Um, there's much more kind of a, a, a notion of kind of bringing kind of intellectual study of the Bible and putting it in the hands of, of many more people. So it's being translated, and then Gutenberg applies it to his press. It's being printed. Um, it's, a, it's a radical revolutionary change that's happening. Um, uh, so, again, so to compare, again, kind of styles um, uh, and, and symbolism, if you look at kind of Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which we looked at in a previous lecture here, it's um, kind of in some ways purely mythological or um, metaphorical or allegorical here. Um, you have the goddess of, of, um, of lust and sex here, Venus, Aphrodite, uh, being blown to shore by these figures that represent the winds, and she's being covered by one of her attendants as she comes to rest on this island. There's very little, if anything, that is redolent of um, you know, Christian morality here. Uh, again, this is Botticelli tapping purely into uh, kind of ancient pre-Christian um, pagan myth and um, painting it according to these new kind of Renaissance um, styles and themes. Now compare that to uh, a painting by Jan van Eyck, you know, roughly, you know, broadly speaking, in the ballpark of when um, painters like, uh, like Botticelli are doing their thing, a little bit earlier, actually. Um, it's, you have, it's much more kind of biblically focused. You have this called the Madonna of Chancellor Rollin. Again, we have uh, the Mother Mary here with the, the Christ child, and it's an anachronistic portrait where she, she's kind of confronted here or she's meeting with um, a figure from Van Eyck's own day. And again, he has his hands in the praying uh, kind of holy pose. But kind of, again, this notion that this, uh, the distance between these holy figures of Mary and Jesus um, and just everyday um, you know, people, uh, the distance is growing um, shorter. And um, I think that's kind of the point, this idea that um, you know, anyone, if you're literate, should be able to read the scriptures. Where in uh, in Italy, 
you still had the popes and the cardinals and the bishops and the priests that kind of said, no, we're the intermediaries. You know, you'll, you'll kind of worship God through us. Um, that's disappearing here. And again, Van Eyck, again, note the extraordinary detail uh, here as well. And um, down to, if, as, so that the detail I just, it's going to pop up here, are these um, pillars in the back. And this stuff too is that unless you look at this very, very closely and you have some kind of notion of what the symbols mean, it would be lost on the casual viewer. So this rewards the, um, the intellectual. It reward, rewards the ones who want to take some time to unpack this. So these kind of panels back here um, are scenes from uh, the Old Testament. So it's Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden here. Uh, Cain, uh, the rivalry was brother, killing his brother Abel. Um, the drunkenness of, of Noah. So they're, they're kind of these sad, kind of dark, tragic events in uh, kind of the Old Testament stories. Um, and some have said what he's really doing there, he's kind of illustrating kind of these deadly sins. Um, it's pride that gets Adam and Eve ki uh, kicked out. It's Cain's envy enviousness of his brother Abel. That's why he kills him. Um, Noah gets drunk and embarrasses himself because of the sin of gluttony. So it's much more, there's much more kind of a heavy-handed moralism to this to these kinds of paintings than I think that you would ever see in an Italian Renaissance painting. Um, maybe here the lion's head have said have, are said to kind of represent you know, anger, another I know, deadly sin, possibly. Um, another detail here, down here, um, you'll see, again, it's just kind of a strange little deal. You see the little rabbits being kind of smooshed by the, uh, um, by the uh, kind of the base of this column here. And some of the rabbits kind of are often a symbol of kind of uncontrolled libido. Um, you know, you should, like, I'm sure you've heard like the phrase like you know, breeding like rabbits. You have lots and lots of kids, and so rabbits um, kind of can represent kind of a libido, a sex drive that's in um, overdrive. Um, and maybe yeah, here lust uh, being squashed here is another kind of dealing with the, another deadly deadly sin in the in the presence of these these holy holy uh, figures. You also get lots of these very uh, I always find these very strange, these depictions of kind of the, the Christ child. You know, he's already holding this object in his hand. He's giving a, a, a blessing, even though he's a baby. But he's kind of a baby that looks like an old man. And that's a, a common kind of theme that artists seem to kind of wanted to try to um, show Jesus uh, as a child, but also kind of give the wisdom of, uh, of an elderly man and to kind of mix the two. To me, it's very unsettling. And then just know all of this kind of this crazy detail in the background, the river, the bridge, these two kids kind of peeking over the, um, the edge, maybe throwing something or, you know, spitting into the river and such. There's lots of other kind of symbols we could pick up, pick on, uh, you know, the peacock here and the, the birds and the buildings. Um, but I think I've kind of given you a taste of, of uh, kind of pointing out the key differences. Other key figures here, Erasmus, a tremendous intellect uh, from the, from the Netherlands, um, educated at the best universities in Paris, traveled all over the place. Um, he was uh, one of these figures that is kind of a northern link between classical antiquity and the present day. So he knew his Latin and Greek. Um, he had a deep respect for Socrates, the, the, the Greek philosopher, the teacher of Plato, again, who lived 400 years before Christ. Um, but he was deeply also interested in kind of connecting that knowledge and that passion from antiquity to... Um, uh, to kind of his understanding of Jesus and his understanding of, of, kind of the Christian Gospels. Um, and uh, he's an early critic uh, of, the, of the Christian church. Well, maybe not an early critic, but a critic whose work kind of pointed towards the Protestant Reformation. His praise of folly was a kind of satire and was kind of calling attention to that, you know, the Catholic Church was filled with kind of these empty rituals. And it was, you know, the burning of incense and these rote prayers and it's in the hands of the priests and they're reading and speaking Latin, and very few people can understand it anymore. So he's saying, what's going on? What's the point of all of these rituals if people can't, you know, understand the scriptures or understand what these things mean? Thomas More is another one who uh, kind of gets himself into hot water. Um, he, too, is a link between that classical world and those kind of pre-Christian um, um, great works of, you know, Homer and Virgil and Cicero and the like. And um, we're very interested in interpreting these things through a kind of a contemporary Christian lens. Um, a man ahead of his time. He had five, um, well, he had many children, but um, he, he wanted his daughters. He thought his daughters should be educated just like anybody else. And this is not an era in which women were, um, you know, generally um, widely educated. But all of his daughters had um, as best of an education he was able to provide for them. 
Um, his most famous work is Utopia, which, as I have here, imagines an ideal society where everyone is concerned with health and independent uh, happiness and independence, as opposed to wealth and power. So he's kind of on. The, um, he's you know we're certainly not to the age of enlightenment or the age of revolution, which gives us the French Revolution and the American Revolution. But his ideas are kind of stirring there. Like you know what is, what what is the place of the individual, um, and uh, why is so much kind of wealth and power accumula accumulating at the top. Um, what would an ideal society be? Um, is it, in an ideal society, would, would, would you still have the oligarchic rich? Would you still have kings and queens? Um, what's really important in society? And so he starts to kind of uh, say, you know, what's important is that um, people are healthy. People are, are, are able to pursue happiness. You can even see kind of that notion of you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that shows up, of course, in early American documents. Um, notions of kind of individual rights are stirring here. Uh, again, a man ahead of his time in terms, not just how he treated his daughters, but in some of these um, extraordinary kind of pre-enlightenment ideas. Um, he was unfortunately executed um, because of uh, he opposed um, Henry VIII. And if you know something about Henry VIII, the, the kind of one of the most notorious kings of England, uh, lots of people were executed for going against uh, Henry VIII. And uh, so Henry VIII, uh, claimed he basically kind of broke off from the Catholic Church, and um, more or less to kind of get a divorce, and he uh, started the Anglican Church, which is still in operation today, um, and it's uh, it presents itself in a very kind of you know, highly you know, high church ritualized kind of Catholic manner, um, but it's an offshoot. It's a it's a it's a kind of you know Protestant break from the church, albeit for Henry VIII's own personal reasons, and he claimed like he was the you know acted like the Pope of that church. And Moore said, no, that's not where things are going. And like Martin Luther and some of these other early reformers, he says, no, we don't need these intermediaries anymore. You don't need a pope. You don't need a bishop. You don't need a priest. Um, the, the scriptures suggest that you can go right to God, and that's why these scriptures need to be translated into the language um, languages of Europe, so everybody can hear them and read them in their own tongue and can go directly to God. So it's within this that... Um, that you know, Martin, Martin Luther, perhaps the most famous reformer, also does his thing, um, uh, or on, kind of on the heels of all this stuff. Um, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther famously nails his 95 theses, his 95 uh, distinct problems that he has with the Catholic Church to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral and starts off a firestorm. And this is, again, is the moment that the, uh, the, the Protestant Church formally starts to break away from the Catholic Church. Um, which sets up a kind of a, a greater divide, uh, again, within Europe. And so you have all of these um, um, Protestant hotbeds in places like we would say, you know, Switzerland and Germany and France and Belgium and Netherlands uh, and the like, uh, whereas, the, you know, the Italian boot of Italy still remains to this day, very Roman Catholic. You know, the Rome, Rome, the Vatican is, you know, still the heart of Catholicism. And so this split in the Catholic Church uh, really about... Um, about, it's about a lot of things, and again, we don't have time to go into all the details, but again, this idea is, who can approach God? Um, in the Roman Catholicism of this time seemed to suggest that, yeah, ordinary, illiterate people, no, you can't do that. You need a priest. You need a bishop. You need the cardinal. You need the pope who stand between you and God. And guys like Martin Luther said, no, we're going to translate the Bible into German, and you can hear the words in, 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 in uh, your own tongue, and you'll see that anybody can pray and go directly to God, and you don't need these kinds of things. It's way more complicated than that, but um, that's a core issue at play here. All right, that's all I got for you on this one. Um, I will talk at you soon.